Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm really honored to be here to uh, celebrate uh, Professor Susan Curry. Uh, let me uh, first of all try to um, share the screen. Okay, um, I would like to talk today of uh, the number sense uh, in animals without a cortex. Um, you are all familiar with the idea that um, uh, other than the symbolic numerical skills, which are probably a uniquely human cultural invention, there is a pre-symbolic and pre-verbal system um, which is evolutionary conserved, the so-called approximate number system, uh, which serves to estimate numerosities uh, or in general quantities, both continuous or uh, discrete, um, countable, uh, in an approximate way. So discrimination between magnitudes in the approximate number system would be ratio dependent, um, in other terms, it obeys Weber law. Uh, and this ability for number sense to, seems to be quite widespread among uh, animals. And I am interested in particular in uh, animals that lack a cortex, that is a laminated structure in the pallium, such as fish, for instance. This is interesting from a, a comparative point of view in order to check to what extent different neural architecture can support um, similar cognitive mechanism with similar signatures. Uh, but also it is interesting because zebrafish are uh, an extraordinary animal model system to investigate the molecular and the genetic mechanisms of behavior and brain mechanisms. Uh, and so uh, given that we don't know very much about the molecular and the genetic mechanisms underlying the number sense, uh, to document this sort of ability and to start a neurobiological investigation uh, using this sort of models um, uh, looks quite important. So let's first of all see some behavioral evidence that uh, zebrafish can show quantity discrimination. Uh, for instance, we use a task uh, based on shoaling behavior in which a fish is tested uh, with group of conspecific visible on one side and the other side uh, behind transparent partition, say one uh, conspecific and two conspecific, and then uh, with mobile uh, partition, uh, one or more of fish in one group are removed, so they are no longer visible, and the amount of stimulation at this point is exactly the same, in this case is one one, whereas previously it was two versus one, and the task for the fish is to approach one or other, that is free choice test, in order to uh, see whether on the basis of memory, not just of sensory stimulation, uh, they can show a preference for the larger numerosity. And these are some of the results we obtain with different ratio. And you can observe, for instance, that if the numerical ratio is uh, uh, 0.5, so quite good, quite easy. Uh, so for instance, one versus two, but also two versus four or four versus eight, fish are quite good at selecting uh, the group with the larger numerosities. And the same is true also when the ratio is 0.67, for instance, two versus three and four versus six, they fail when the ratio is closer to one, so 0.75, if 
3 versus 4 and 6 versus 8. So you can observe basically that choice discrimination in zebrafish seems to be based on the approximate number system. It doesn't depend on the use of small or large numerosities, but just on the ratio between uh, numerosities. Uh, we also tested zebrafish uh, for ordinal aspects of uh, uh, number understanding, that is ordinal numerosity that refers to the position or rank of specific element in relation to other elements in a set. So for instance, uh, zebrafish were tested in, along a, run, a, 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 a corridor and there are a series of uh, door uh, which are blocked by plexiglass, but by pushing one allow the fish to exit and to enter a larger environment with food and females, these are males. And they have to select a particular door on the basis of the ordinal position. So for instance, the second uh, from uh, the left, or if you prefer the fourth from the right. And you can see here an example. This is a zebrafish which has been successfully trained. Choose the second one, which is marked by the uh, red arrow. And you can see the results of this experiment here. And we choice uh, for the second uh, door, which is quite clear. Obviously, it's difficult to say whether the fish are really counting on the basis of the, sequ the sequence, or if they are simply um, using distance in some way. So we performed a series of experiments. For instance, uh, uh, in one experiment, the total length of the setup was reduced in such a way to create a conflict between absolute special information and ordinal numerical information. So during training, the second door is the correct one, which is marked by a certain distance with, with respect to the end point. And then uh, the size of these small columns are changed in such a way that the same distance at this point is uh, for the third rather than the second one. But you can see that fish choose correctly on the basis of number, not distance. Here, similar, the inter-element distance is reduced in such a way that the previously correct second door is now the third one. But you can see that again, fish choose on the basis of uh, number rather than distance. So we wonder whether maybe it is not absolute, but some sort of proportion of distances which are they using, which is shown here. In this case, the ratio between say the distance between the first and the second and the overall distance covering all the doors is changed at test in such a way that the correct uh, proportion would identify in this case the third door, whereas uh, um, uh, the, the correct one is a different spatial distance is the second. And you can see that in this case fish fail, they choose mostly the third, but not completely, not only, they also show a preference for the second one, which is statistically significant. So they seem to encode both ordinal position and spatial distances, relational spatial distances. And in this case, they seem to be not able to, to decide between the two alternatives. I, I guess human would be in a similar condition in this task. Using other kind of fish, uh, other species such as archer fish, for instance, uh, we investigated other aspects more sophisticated of the cognition uh, in fish. These are fish that, that are very interesting from the behavioral point of view because they uh, have the habits of uh, spit a jet of water in order to capture small insects and prey. So they perform this very precise response uh, and we investigated the ability of uh, archer fish to discriminate relative or absolute discrimination. So for instance, series of dots, 10 versus five, and after learning, do they learn more than less or rather they learn a specific numerosity, 10. And this can be tested by changing in a proper way the numerosities. 
Uh, this is the way in which fish were trained. At the start, we use a, on the computer screen, which is placed above the tank, uh, an insect, a simulated insect. So then slowly it is changing a dot. And then fin finally they are trained with dots. And we have developed a, a, um, a script recently, which has been published, in order to control the different uh, non uh, the, the different continuous variables are associated with change in numerosity. So, interdistance, density, radius, convex hull, total uh, area, density, and total perimeter. Uh, and so, we tested fish in a series of trials with continuous control. So, for instance, some trials were radius fixed and interdistance and convex hull was identical in the two sti stimuli. Other trials were similar overall area, again, interdistance convex hull control, or similar contour length, interdistance and convex hull control. Uh, I show you an example of uh, the, uh, the performance of our archer fish. They are trained in this case to spit on the six dots. Okay, show you another example from a different vantage point. In this case, the reward is the second, uh, the, is the three dots. Um, so a fish learned the task in about um, 11 session on average. And they were training for this, uh, in this case, on three versus six, one half with three as reinforced positive, or six as reinforced with continuous changes in the uh, continuous physical variables. And then after that, they were tested for choices, for instance, for two versus three, such a way that in this case, if they choose the absolute number, they would choose three. If they choose on the basis of uh, uh, relative numerosity, they would choose two, or six versus nine. Noted that in this case, six, that was the negative is positive in this case, or a completely different pair, five versus eight. And the same is uh, true for the different, for the parallel condition in which archer fish were trained with the six as positive. And you can see that they choose very, very clearly on the basis of the relative numerosity. So after training three versus six, they choose the smaller with different numerosity, irrespective of whether it was a numerosity that in absolute terms was reinforced or not reinforced previously. This is true also for small numerosity, like two versus three, is shown here, that generalize to three versus four and three versus six. Okay. Um, the reason to investigate a fish, and in particular zebrafish, as I told you, is to look at the neural basis of number sense in these animals. Uh, we know at present that there are apparently areas and neurons, at least in the uh, monkey brain and also in the nidopalium caudolaterale of the crows, that selectively respond to number, numerosity. And and the areas which are being involved are the prefrontal cortex, the parietal cortex, and the homologous in the monkey brain, and an equivalent, not an homologous, of the prefrontal cortex, which is called nidopalium caudolaterale in crows. Uh, but what about zebrafish and what about fish in general? Uh, to study the problem, we develop a method of habituation, dishabituation, similar in a sense to the tasks which are typically used with infants. So fish were habituated in a series of uh, trials uh, in uh, five days to the presentation of a particular numerosity, three, and the physical characteristics were changed according to the script I described before, change in density, change in overall area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then uh, on day six, they were tested with a novel stimulus for dishabituation. 
And the disabituation could be either a change in number or in shape or in size, either an increase or a decrease in size, or control group in which there was no uh, change. Um, fish responded quite well to change. You can see here time spent close to the stimulus, which increased as a result of disabituation for all changes. And after that, um, we, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I can show you an example of the exploration that fish show uh, uh, during the disabituation phase. That is, uh, the, the longer time they spend close to the novel stimulus with respect to, to, the, um, to the fish that were habituated to a particular number in this case. Next step was to sacrifice the animal and using a particular technique, which is early gene expression, uh, to measure which area show activation in neural activity. Uh, early gene expression, these are genes which are activated soon after, about well, one hour after uh, the, uh, the activity at the synapses. So we can measure quantitatively quite precisely using PCR, the expression uh, in different areas of the brain. Uh, this is a schematic representation of the zebrafish brain, and we check by a punch analysis expression of CFOS and EGR1, which are two early genes, uh, in, the, in these areas, in the uh, more ventral pallium, in the DM, the dorsal, a medial pallium, the dorsal lateral, this part which is presumed homologous of the hippocampal formation, and this is presumed homologous of the amygdala, and this DC, which is apparently uh, an homologous of associative areas in the brain of uh, fish. Uh, briefly, what we found was that there was uh, 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 some selectivity of response to changing shape in the dorsolateral, perhaps because of the spatial aspect associated with the changing shape, where if assuming that DL is an homologous of the hippocampus. But most interestingly, we found that in the DC, there was a specific response to numerosity, which uh, was associated with the change, that is, those trained with three dots and presented then at the disabituation phase with nine show an increase in C force and EGR1, and vice versa with respect to the control group, those trained with nine then presented with three show a decrease. There was also activity in, the, uh, in response to the shape, in this case, uh, without changing the direction, uh, which is shown here. Um, so we wonder whether looking at the DC using more subtle technique, namely in situ hybridization uh, and uh, mm, looking at the uh, cells which are expressed in different slices of this area. So we look for a more mm, uh, caudal and in, in a more rostral part. We, we have three sections, C, D, A. And you can see that in the more rostral part, we found activity, selectivity of response only to shape change, no selectivity uh, for number and shape in the middle region. But in the more caudal part, there was selectivity of response only to number, as shown before. So apparently, there seems to be a specific area at the dorsal central part of the telencephalon uh, which responds selectivity, selectively to change in numerosity, in visual numerosity. Um, we were interested in the possibility that uh, other areas, in particular uh, lower level areas, could be also involved in these tasks. You know that there is now evidence in humans and also in monkeys that uh, apart from the parietal area, some degree of selectivity of response to number could be apparent 
uh, in uh, uh, even in the primary visual areas, according to some uh, papers. So we look at the um, uh, anatomical organization of the pallium of zebrafish. This is the retina, and these are the main uh, part of the thalamus, the main nucleus of the thalamus that project to the telencephalon. I note that projection to DC and DL occur mainly from two regions, the PGL, the preglomerular complex, this in green, and the abedula. So again, we repeated the same experiment behaviorally I described before, and we look at the expression the more rostral and the more caudal part of the thalamus. And what we found was that there was a selectivity of response in the avenula for both change in number in this case, but also to a certain extent, change in size in continuous quantity. And this was also more clear in the PGL, the preglomerular complex. You see, uh, again, change modulated by the direction of habituation, dishabituation in the reverse direction with respect to the, to the telencephalon, which is interesting in terms of the circuitry involved, but also responses to changing in size, that is in continuous quantity. So it seems that there are at least two regions of the, of, of the thalamus in zebrafish uh, that show some degree of selectivity to quantity both continuous and discrete. And uh, at least one of these uh, thalamic nuclei project to a central part of the telencephalon, a pallial region, equivalent of the cortex in other terms, which there seems to be in the more caudal part, selectivity only to numerosity, only to discrete uh, and not continuous quantity. So thank you very much for your attention. This is a, a, a quick list of the collaborators. This is a work that involved other than my lab, also the lab of uh, uh, Caroline Brennan, a, a molecular genetist in, uh, based on Queen Mary University, and Scott Fraser, who is at the University of California, Southern California. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your attention and of course uh, I, I, I am happy to uh, to consider your your questions and curiosity thank you